God's grace, mercy, and peace belong to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. These words are from Ephesians chapter 5. Be very careful then how you live. Do not live as unwise, live as wise. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father in everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the words of God. In the name of God, the Holy Spirit, who lives in our hearts by faith and who leads us to lead lives of self-control, my dear Christian friends. Every year, mom and dad load up the kids in the back of the wood-paneled station wagon, and they headed to Grandpa's farm. And every time they got to Grandpa's farm, Grandpa would take out those grandkids and hold them up in his hands and throw them up on top of the tractor and give them a little ride around the farm. Well, then mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, the adults, would go back into the house, but the kids would run around and play in the farm where there were lots more open spaces. This year in particular, and it was the third or fourth year that this had happened, the kids decided, you know, I've seen grandpa start this tractor in a lot of times. I'll bet you I can figure out how to start that tractor. And so the seven-year-old climbed up in the seat, and he got that baby to fire off. And then they figured out that he couldn't only start the tractor, but he had watched Grandpa put it into gear and be able to drive it around the barnyard. You know, it would be really foolish, wouldn't it, for Grandma to watch the grandkids driving the tractor through the barnyard with other little siblings hanging off the side and Grandpa to say, do you hear something? What, what's that noise I hear? And Grandma said, oh, don't worry about it. All the grandchildren are just driving your great big tractor all around the barnyard. There's nothing to worry about. Mom's cooking in the kitchen, and she's chopping up all of the vegetables for dinner. She's pretty good. It's not quite like on TV where they do it so fast that you can barely even see them picking up the knife. But mom's pretty good. She can, she can bust through those vegetables and get all the chopping up real, real, real well. So she moves over to the sink and the colander, and she's washing and rinsing them out. Meanwhile, she's focusing on the sink. The three-year-old boy comes and swipes the knife off chopping block and he runs around the island in the kitchen and he's wielding it like a samurai sword wouldn't it be really foolish for mom to go back and say what happened to my knife and for dad to say oh don't worry your three-year-old son is just ready to cut the guts out of all of his siblings there's nothing here to worry about We, we realize in all kinds of different ways where there's something that's dangerous that's going on, where there's something that's threatening that's going on. And when we read then the opening words of our text today, be very careful how you live, this should wash over us without, with us paying it a little bit more attention than just to say, oh, we're just walking through life. There's not really any danger for us as Christians. How can Christians like us say that the devil is real, that the sinful world in which we live is not really any big deal? It's trying to rip the faith out of our hearts that inside my own heart and inside you lives a sinful, a wicked, and evil nature that will love nothing else than to throw the devil, than to throw out God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ out of our hearts so that all we do is gratify our sinful nature all the time. We can't in one breath acknowledge that we've got these powerful enemies and then say, don't worry. There's no danger to you and me living a Christian life. This is why the author in the Bible here in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, he says, be careful how you live. Be vigilant. Be on your guard. 
A little bit later, he says, because the days are evil. In fact, he goes on to say, then live your life as wise rather than as fools. In fact, the rest of the lesson this morning kind of sets up almost like you're studying one of the Ten Commandments. Because there's a list of things that God tells us, don't do this thing. Don't do this. You're a Christian. You believe in Jesus. He died. He forgave your sins. He spilled his blood. He redeemed you. He bought you back. He owns you. He now lives in your heart by faith. If you now belong to Jesus Christ, if you're connected to the vine, then don't do this. This is unbefitting. This is unbecoming of a Christian. And then the second half of our de devotion this morning, do this. This is what is becoming of a Christian. This is how a Christian ought to conduct themselves. Or, as we have, what do we have in the bulletin? The Wise Christian's Guide to Do's and Don'ts of Leading a Christian Life. If we're going to be careful how we live, the first thing that we ought to pay attention to is a list of don'ts. What things do we not want to do? What things do we want to avoid? The first thing that God says in our text is, do not be foolish. You know, the way we talk in English is as follows. Well, that was dumb. That wasn't so smart. Well, that was stupid. Well, that was idiotic. That was moronic. And we have all these different words that get progressively more and more insulting. We even have four-letter words, vulgarities, that we use if we really feel as though we want to make a point. God doesn't get into all of those degrees. God's got one word that he uses, and it's four letters, at least in English, that he uses to categorize everything that lives a life apart from the Word of God. He calls that person a fool. When the Bible calls a person a fool, that is the largest insult that our living God could possibly give. So when he says in our text this morning, do not be a fool, it conjures up and calls to mind an unbelieving kind of a life. In fact, there's a story in the New Testament. Do you remember this one from the Gospel of Luke in which there's a rich guy? God's blessing him. He's making money hand over fist. He can't even store up all of his barn, store up all of his grains in his barns. He says, I can't believe I'm rolling in cash. I gotta sell this property. I gotta be a, buy a bigger property. I gotta build bigger barns to be able to store up it all. And then you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna retire early. I'm gonna travel the world. I'm gonna put up my feet. I'm gonna take life easy. Early retirement. Shouldn't that be the goal of every person? To which God says, you're a fool. You're a fool if that's your attitude. Today your life's going to be demanded from you. And then who's going to get all your money? And then Jesus explains, this is what life is like for people who are selfish and greedy for themselves but are not rich toward God. When the Bible warns us against living like a fool, he's warning us, at least in that example, of being selfish or being greedy and living life in such a way that is completely disconnected to a life of faith with God, which is to use whatever you have in the world to advance the kingdom of God and to advance the gospel. There's a second, story, a second example in the Old Testament where the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When God says, do not live your life as a fool, it means then come to faith in Jesus Christ and live your life in such a way that embraces God, that trusts in Jesus, that realizes that the price he paid, the redemption price, his body and blood, is an expensive and a lavish price for you that won your ticket and your entrance into heaven. Then live your life in gratitude rather than in ingratitude toward God. There's a second way second don't that God gives in the text. The first thing he says is don't be a fool. The second thing he says is don't get drunk on wine. I suppose that the cynic who is sitting in the audience or in the congregation might say, well, okay, don't get drunk on wine, but beer and whiskey are okay. No. No, what God is saying is don't get drunk, period. Because he follows this up in, what is this, verse 17? Don't get drunk on wine because it leads to debauchery. People make this observation when you get into substance abuse, right? They talk about, they talk about marijuana as a gateway drug, right? If you start dabbling with this, pretty soon you end up stuck 
in other kinds of substances. What God, he's making the same point here. Don't get drunk on wine. You're not in control of yourself anymore. The alcohol's in control of you. If you get drunk on wine, if you get drunk, period, that's going to lead to further and further sins. It leads to debauchery, which is kind of an old-fashioned word for sexual immorality of different kinds and of different sorts. In other words, if you don't have control of yourself, you're not going to be able to say no to other sins and temptations when you should be saying no to other sins and temptations. That's a foolish kind of life. That's a temptation. So just don't even go there. This is something that we should probably talk about, not just today, but because we're going into the season where sports are kind of amping up and all of the commercials are going to be coming out that says, don't drink and drive. If you're going to drink, make sure you give your keys to somebody else. Okay, this is, of course, good advice, right? But the suggestion on the commercials is, it's okay to get blitzed. Go out and get drunk. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to do that, at least be responsible, give your keys to somebody else. But what God says in the Bible is that for the Christian, you shouldn't get drunk in the first place. Because you shouldn't ever have to encounter the temptation of having to give your keys to somebody else because that's an indication that you have lost your self-control. That you are not in control, that it's the alcohol that's making your decisions for you. This is two examples of what God says in the scriptures of a foolish kind of life. Greediness, selfishness, drunkenness. These are all slippery slopes to other kinds of sins that eventually lead you away from God. Well, now you understand why the Apostle Paul begins by saying, be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. My goodness, the temptations for us to be lazy in our Christianity are everywhere. If we're not constantly vigilant, my goodness, we can slip into selfishness and greediness and drunkenness just like this. It happens just that fast. And so when the Bible says, be careful how you live, live as wise, the wise Christian who is blood bought by Jesus Christ realizes that I need to say no to these temptations when they're presented to me. Now, some of you are going to remember that when you've gone through school and you've learned the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are always divided in two, right? We'll just take an example. The second commandment talks about do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Right? Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And then we explain it this way. We should fear and love God that we do not curse, swear, lie, deceive, or use God's name superstitiously. Right? That's Luther's explanation to the second commandment. The don'ts. Don't curse or swear, lie or deceive, or use God's name superstitiously. But you always go on in the second half of the explanation to say, not only this is what God forbids, but Luther always also explains this is what God wants. Not just the behavior to avoid, but the behavior that God seeks. The do's, right? What are the do's? Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't curse where lie to see you. Use God's name superstitiously. But call on God's name when you're in trouble. Do that. Pray. Do that. Give thanks in every situation. Pray, praise, and give thanks. And so just in the explanation to the one commandment, there's the don'ts and there's the do's. Well, this text from Ephesians sets up the same way. God doesn't only want, us to, want to warn us about living a careful life to tell us what not to do. There's also behavior he wants us to be encouraged by. This is what God wants you to do. And the first thing that God talks about here is make the most, this is verse 16, make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. It kind of sounds like generic and general advice, doesn't it? Make the most of every opportunity. And immediately people are going to say, yeah, that's right. Make the most of every opportunity. My mortgage is at 5.2%, and I just saw an advertisement that I could lower it to 3.75%. If I finance now, and I could get cheaper closing costs as well, too. That's not the opportunity that God's talking about. Then what does God mean? When God says in the Bible, make the most of every opportunity, what does that mean? It means you're Christian people. Jesus Christ died for your sins. You're on your way to heaven. That means for your own soul and for everyone else's soul, do whatever you need to do today, right now, in the interest of feeding your own faith and getting the word of God to anybody else. 
Seize the day. Take advantage of the opportunity to come to believe in Jesus Christ now and to enable as many other people as possible to do that as well. I'll give you an example of this. And it's a little bit of a bigger picture type of an example. People ask me about this from time to time. They say, Pastor, the school, a lot of the revenue for the school is coming from Arizona tuition tax credit dollars. Yep. Well, what happens if up in Phoenix, all of these you know, politicians are replaced by all of those kinds of politicians, and then all of the laws are reversed? Well, what do you want me to say? Well, then the money goes away and we don't have the money anymore. We've got to figure out a different way to fund the school, right? Isn't that what the answer is? I, I don't know what's so complicated about that, but people are curious. Are, are you trying to insinuate that we're not supposed to take advantage of the opportunity that God is giving us now? Isn't there an opportunity? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Say no because there's a danger or a threat that in five years, in eight years, in ten years, that maybe some of these things go away? Well, we'll let them take care of that. But God has given us an opportunity to be able to educate children and advance the kingdom of God. Seize the opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunity today. Because you don't know what the opportunity is going to be tomorrow. Maybe Jesus is going to come before somebody else replaces those people. I don't know. But when the Bible says seize the opportunity, do what you need to do to advance the kingdom now. Look, parents, you know how this goes with your kids. Every single study that's been done says the wheelhouse for opportunity for kids is age zero through five. That's when you set the spiritual habits. If you bring them to Jesus, if you baptize them, if you bring them to church, they will stay in church for the rest of their life. If you don't start until they're five or six or seven, like grade school age, the chances drop from like 80% retention down to 30% retention. Take advantage of the opportunity. Bring them to Jesus. Have them be baptized. Bring them to schools, preschool, Sunday school, so that Jesus Christ is in their heart. Have the home devotions. Do what you need to do. You know, the old saying is, they're not a trailer hitch on a hearse because you can't take your material goods with you. You know what you can take with you to heaven? Your kids. Your spouse. People with whom you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what do you think God's talking about when he says, take advantage of every opportunity? What difference does it make if your mortgage is refinanced to this or that percent in the grand scheme of things? whoop de do. What God's talking about is store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Do that. Pursue those opportunities and seize the day. The second thing that God talks about is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is just a simple way of God saying, grow your faith like the vine that's pictured on the board. We've talked all summer long about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. There's another verse from the book of Philippians that says, whatever's pure, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's praiseworthy, think of those things. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, don't we at some point have to say, my eyes are looking at this on the internet. I can't look at that on the internet anymore. It's not fruit of the Spirit. It's not true and noble and praiseworthy. My eyes are viewing this on television or wherever. It's not praiseworthy. It's not good for my soul. It's not an opportunity for me to grow my faith. Look, you guys are adults. You're mature Christians. You can determine this, but God is giving you encouragements. If you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then let's keep in step with God's Holy Spirit and pursue those things that God says to do. The last thing I think we can probably categorize in one lump sum. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Of course, there's psalms in the Bible. We know there's a whole book called Psalms. But there's also spiritual hymns, or uh, hymns and spiritual songs. Moses wrote a hymn. Miriam wrote a hymn. In the New Testament, Paul, there's all kinds of different doxologies in the New Testament. What Paul is talking about here, know your Holy Scripture so well that the way you converse with other Christians is basically with the Word of God in the context of Christianity in, from a perspective of faith. See, he says, speak to one another. 
Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. Do this. Take advantage of opportunities. Know what God's will is. Speak to one another. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the wise Christian's way to living a life of the do's and don'ts according to God's will. It also helps you understand whew, how challenging it can be to be a Christian. Huh? If it were all so easy, we would hop on it and we'd have, we'd have it done by the end of the day. It's never so easy. Th this is a day by day and grace by grace step and walk with God. And where I trip and I fall, there is my Lord Jesus Christ to stoop down and forgive me, to wash me clean from his sins, to pick me up and put a little strength in my bones and a little spring in my step and say, go on there, my dear child. I've died for you and I've forgiven you. Now go and avoid the don'ts and go chase after the do's one more time. When a little careful life, it means that Christianity is not on autopilot. It means that Christianity is not on cruise control. We don't take an unthinking man's approach to living my Christian life. It's conscientious. It's thought through. It's deliberate. It's engaged in. It's on my mind. It's in my heart with psalms and spiritual songs so that I'm embracing who I am in Jesus Christ, blood-bought child of God who now devotes my life to avoiding these don'ts and to serving God with these do's. Amen.